This meeting is now being recorded. Well, good evening. Welcome to the EDS Awareness Educational Series webinar. My name is John Furman. Before we get, get started and introduce our speaker, I want to go over a little agenda for you, uh, who we are, what is our program, upcoming events. We're going to introduce our speaker for this evening, Cynthia Allen, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So again, my name is John Furman. I manage the National EDS Awareness Program based in Cincinnati, Ohio. My daughter, Deanna, heads the Cleveland, Ohio EDS support group. She was diagnosed with EDS in 2008, the same year my wife passed away with breast cancer. I was a caregiver for my wife for, who struggled with undiagnosed EDS for over 30 years. So we introduced our program at the 2012 EDS conference to help EDSers form independent local support groups and spread EDS awareness in their communities. We've started over 70 groups to date. Each group is given their own free website with a link from the directory and map. We receive feedback that conferences provide valuable information and social opportunities for many who cannot afford physically and financially, but many of us cannot afford physically and financially to attend in person. So we decided to bring the speakers to you through the free EDS Awareness Educational Series. We meet every first and third Tuesday, typically at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. All programs are free. The meeting announcements and where possible, the webinar recordings will be posted on our website at edsawareness.com for later replay. You can receive email announcements for future sessions by requesting the free report on our site. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Body Support Store, where you'll find over 250 products selected by EDSers for EDSers. The store is the only funding for our program, and it usually covers our monthly web fees. So please visit our store and check out the helpful products that we sell. So just a general disclaimer, the presentation contains general information about EDS. Members of the EDS community voluntarily participate in this program. The information is not advice. If you're having medical problems now, please call 911. Always consult your doctor before making any changes to your treatment. Upcoming events include our next webinar, which is Tuesday, April 7th. And uh, we're pleased to present Dr. Forrest Tennant, who's um, been uh, working with uh, chronic pain patients since 1975. And he is presenting Centralized Intractable Pain in Ehlers-Danlos. On April 11th, um, we'll have a physician's conference. EDS Awareness is partnering with the CSF, which is the Chiari Foundation, to conduct a free physician conference at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. This will be at their Liberty Township campus, which is in a suburb on the north side of the city. Um, our topics and speakers included will be Dr. Derek Nielsen from Cincinnati Children's, who's going to talk about EDS hypermobility, evolving perspectives on a poorly understood problem. Um, Dr. John Mitakaitis from Dayton, who will talk about TMJ and CCI in the EDS patient. And also Dr. Andrew Ringer from the Mayfield Chiari Center, who will talk about Chiari diagnosis and treatment options. Look at our website for more details. For those attending live tonight, there will be an opportunity for Q&A after the presentation. Add your questions at any time by clicking the Q&A icon at the top of your screen. After typing in your question, click the orange button to submit. 
Our speaker tonight is Cynthia Allen, and Cynthia is going to talk to us about the Feldenkrais Method and other approaches to improve function and ease. She has been working in holistic practices, healthcare management, and organizational consulting for over 25 years. Cynthia is a certified Feldenkrais practitioner and certified Bones for Life teacher and trainer. She's a senior trainer in movement intelligence and the co-author of Integral Human Gait Theory, and she teaches uh, gait wild human potential workshops. She works with people of all ages and levels of function um, at her um, facility, Future Life Now, which is located in Cincinnati, Ohio, and she sees clients and also teaches CE courses throughout the U.S. And with that, um, I'm especially pleased to welcome Cynthia. Um, we're looking forward to your presentation. You're going to see your slides are loading on the screen. I'm going to go ahead and turn over the microphone to you. Thank you so much, uh, Deanna and John. I appreciate it and uh, appreciate the wonderful work your organization is doing in making things available. And I'm working on my screen share right at the moment. It should take just a moment to, to pop up here. Okay. And I was first um, introduced to Cynthia by a, uh, a pain management uh, physical medicine rehab doctor down in Cincinnati. And, and uh, he, had, he was very knowledgeable in EDS and had suggested that I might try Feldenkrais. So, so I've, uh, I've been a Feldenkrais practicer here a little bit, and, and I've, I've really seen a lot, of, um, a lot of good come from it. So it's a good, good thing to have in your toolbox. And I'm really excited to have Cynthia here with us tonight. Great. So I, I think my slides are up now. They are. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you. So um, words like Feldenkrais and somatics are kind of large, and I will be uh, talking about what they mean. But if I were going to just encapsulate in a, in a nutshell what it is I do, I'm really an expert in helping people learn how to move with greater ease. And I'm not an expert in Ehlers-Danlos, so I think you're used to having people who are clinicians by background in most of your talks. I've looked back through some of the past and upcoming ones. So this might be a little bit different for you, but I'm hopeful that you will find it very enjoyable and beneficial. So my objective for this time together is to explain the Feldenkrais method and related approaches to discuss the underlying principles that promote healing, provide you with a felt sense, an actual brief experience of um, these approaches, and then also just to give you another possibility so that you will uh, you know, have some hope about what else you can do for yourself and to make the other uh, interventions that you're receiving more likely to even be uh, more potent. Uh, when you come to the Q&A piece, uh, it, I will, would really love for you to tell me what is interesting about the discussion as well as your questions, about the lecture as well as your questions. And also when we come into movement opportunities that I lead you through, I hope you'll take a moment after that to drop a note about what your experience with that is. So let's begin with what is somatic education. The Feldenkrais method is part of somatic education. Soma is Greek for body, so that clearly we're talking about something about body learning, body education. The term somatic education was coined by Thomas Hanna, a student of Moshe Feldenkrais's. It describes a body of work um, where the principles of learning through the living body or living through the learning body are all shared. They all involve uh, movement. All the items or the modalities that fit under this umbrella involve movement and hold in common that humans are able to change and grow throughout their lifetime. Now, how each one of them does this through movement will differ a little bit, which would make some a better match for a person at one time or another. Here's some pretty common ones, Feldenkrais Method, Alexander Technique, are probably the two you're going to have heard of the most. But you may have heard of uh, Hannah Somatics or Body Mind Centering or the Not Banyal Method, and there are quite a few more that fit under this umbrella. We're going to be talking about the Feldenkrais Method, Movement Intelligence, and um, things that fit 
under that umbrella to, tonight. Let's begin with the origins of the Feldenkrais method. <clears throat> I'd like to start really with the birth of the founder and and his uh, how his work came about. When you have a work that is really tied closely to a specific founder, understanding the roots of that work help you to understand how it developed and, and what it's aimed at. So Moshe Feldenkrais was born in the Ukraine in 1904. He died in 1984. He was raised in a Jewish rabbinical family, living in Russia at a time where programs were being held to eliminate Jews. And Feldenkrais was acutely aware early in his life that um, threat of death took a toll on a human body and psyche. He chose to leave when he was um, 14, walking from his home there in the Ukraine to Palestine for the new Jewish homeland that was being promised. He went across sub-zero temperatures and a vast amount of land with other children, and when he arrived, of course, the new homeland was mostly waiting to be built or settlements. There were very high tensions in that area. Arabs had been displaced, and so there were regular attacks from the Arabs towards the Jewish um, immigrants, and the Jews were not allowed to have any kind of weapon, not, including not even a knife. The uh, youth spent a lot of time learning martial arts and self-defense and really prided themselves. You know, these 14, 15, 16-year-old boys prided them, proud, were really proud of their ability to organize themselves and become better protectors. But whenever an attack came, one of the things that was really consistent was that people would put their hands up to uh, defend them, our faith. And that means everything they had been learning in the martial arts and self-defense realm was just out the window, leaving them open for an attack with a knife. And Feldenkrais, at that age already, wanted to understand what was happening. And he really realized the importance of connecting with the person's instinctual movements when they're under threat. So that if you have an instinctual movement, it's better to recognize it and deal with that and then build from there and he came up with a new approach to self-defense, teaching people how to accept that movement and then go into disarming people, um, the attacker from that point. And this understanding of instinct is uh, key in his work. He went on to develop his first book on self-defense and he later developed the Israeli uh, self-defense program. He moved um, from Israel to France for college. He eventually got his, uh, not only his undergraduate degree, but he went on to Sorbonne and got his degree in, uh, math, uh, sorry, his doctorate in general science. While he was um, playing soccer and being a very active uh, young man and an active uh, scientist, he hurt his knee uh, in a very severe way and in fact tore all the ligaments and injured the meniscus. So he really had an unstable knee that was not at all reliable. Surgery uh, at that time would have only allowed him maybe a 50% success rate, which he calls, as a scientist, no better than fate. And, um, and then he, if that came out even okay, they said he'd have a stiff knee the rest of his life. This became a really important peace for him. So while he was interested in movement up to this point, now he was highly motivated because he was not able to walk well and didn't really know how his life was going to play out. Also while he was in Paris, he met Kano, the creator of judo. And um, judo became a really important influencer of Feldenkrais's life. Kano invited him to become the first uh, Westerner to really bring judo into, uh, into the West, into France and beyond, and Feldenkrais really picked up that mantle. During the day, he was working at Curie Labs. At night, he was teaching uh, judo to the rest of the scientists, and I don't know about you, but I kind of think it's fun to think of Madame Curie studying judo. <laughs> and uh, with, to go along with that, um, he was working on submarines, working with radioactive materials and the development of the very early radioactive atom bomb elements. 
It, this is also the time, of course, when the Nazis were starting to encroach into Paris. And in that time, as the Nazis were coming in to um, Paris, Feldenkrais found that his knee became very swollen and inflamed. And this is another pinnacle time for him where he realized, oh, emotions, stress, even past trauma can really have a profound effect on the physical body. Because he hadn't done anything to hurt it at that time, he really saw that as being related to the stress of the impending attack. As they invaded Paris, he and his wife escaped from the city with a task of carrying a, a suitcase full of nuclear secrets out of the country. After the war, Feldenkrais decided that instead of returning to work at the Curie Labs, he was going to really pursue movement and awareness. He was already had already participated in publishing several books by this point. He um, was very interested in auto-suggestion and the study of how deep relaxation or subliminal, subliminal thoughts were helpful to people in turning around their lives. Also, very interesting aspects that influence his work. Over time, what happened for him is as he began to really work with his own knee situation more and more, he developed not just from working with his actual knee, but to, to working with his entire self. So in the beginning, he talks about how he worked with his knee in a way that was a little bit more like a surgeon might work with it, piecemeal, and he got very good results initially. Uh, but then he slipped and and fell and injured it again, and he felt like, oh, my gosh, I'm back to where I started. I suddenly, he said, I just didn't really think that I hadn't really been thinking about me myself as a whole person. And so he went back and started to study even more in depth, incorporating in childhood development, the understanding of neurophysiology at the time, other Eastern philosophies, trying to pull together all these things that would really look at the emotional aspect as well as how the entire body brain functioned in order to allow a person to uh, make the most of their particular situation. So he said, I believe that the unity of mind and body is an objective reality. They are not just parts somehow related to each other, but an inseparable whole while functioning. A brain without a body could not think. This is a really key aspect. A brain without a body could not think. Well, what does that really mean practically? We're extremely used to thinking in our particular culture about the anatomies of detail or chemistry, and, and these are incredible advances that are really important in being able to further medicine. But it's also very easy to get highly compartmentalized. And um, when we get too compartmentalized, when treatment is driven in that way, we are often left with a bag full of unexpected and unwanted effects. So because the Feldenkrais method is not a treatment, so I'm not a clinician, I'm an educator, and I help people learn about themselves so that they become a better expert on themselves than I could ever be. So we're not a treatment, but instead a way of engaging in learning, we have that pleasure of helping people consciously connect all the parts back into a unified whole. So we have here this baby Liv. We're going to actually watch a little video of her in a moment. But she is, and as we are, a whole being that is really greater than the sum of our parts. Something that I feel is vastly underrated in um, is the fact that we are organic beings and we're actually in a continual process with ourselves that is a kind of co-creation or sculpting of our potential. Yes, we have genetic potential that we're coming into the world with that may have limitations, sometimes fairly significant feeling limitations, and in fact, they are limitations. But yet, if we accept those too readily, we can miss out on this opportunity to understand how we remake our bodies based on how we use ourselves, how we move, how we think, and the environment in which we do this. We surely do not have total influence um, over 
our lives, but we do have influence. So that even a simple choice, such as the shoes we wear, really changes the very structure of our feet and then affects everything above. So that's just like one easy example. I'd like to bust a little bit of a myth that movement is exercise. Exercise is definitely movement, but movement to be limited to exercise is incredibly limiting. And so when you hear the word movement, you might be like a lot of people who start to go, oh man, they're talking about exercise. But actually not talking about exercise. Movement is your breath traveling in and out. Movement is your red blood cells beating through your arteries, movements the contraction of your bowel or your esophagus. Movement is a thought, a thought like, wow, this is the most boring lecture EDS has been sponsored yet, or uh, this is the most fascinating one. And that thought not only has an emotion tied to it, it has a physical response to it. So that in the Feldenkrais work, we understand that there is nothing that the human does that does not involve movement. And when we reduce that to exercise, we're really missing the opportunity moment to moment to improve the quality of our entire life just by attending to the, the small and vital aspects. One of my, or two of my favorite sayings, actually, are quality movement is quality medicine. And I say that first one particularly for people who are feeling like they might not be able to walk. I understand some people who tune in may not be able to walk right now. And if you want to bump up that, um, amp up that ante, then quality walking is quality medicine because weight-bearing uh, movement is extremely important. So for me, the, the movement, for the sake of movement, is not enough. You see that I put the words quality in here. That quality is an ever-expanding range. So this is not something to attain. It's just something to be engaged with over, I think, over my lifetime. And I, I highly recommend that for all of the people I come in contact with. We engage with that improvement of quality in the Feldenkrais work with the way we breathe, the way we chew, the way we swallow, sit, reach, stand, and yes, walk. And we're taking that, you know, all these really important aspects that we might take for granted and gradually kind of elevating it, if you will, to a top shelf quality medicine or nutrition. And I suppose if there was only one thing that you left this presentation with today, it would be the importance of engaging with yourself around quality movement, not as an end goal, but as a process. Because if you get that idea, <clears throat> sorry, it means there's going to be hope. There's going to be something that you can do to make your situation a little better or maybe even a lot better. And then from there, it's only a matter of figuring out what the next step is. In the Feldenkrais method, we explore in two main ways. The first one uh, in this slide on the left, functional integration, is individual sessions. And in these sessions, a practitioner is customizing the session according to the client's goals and their situation. Um, the session might be done on a uh, low padded table and you might be lying on your side or your back or even your belly. All of this is done in a comfortable setting so we would not put people in a position that was uncomfortable for them. We seek to make things as comfortable as possible. Um, it could also be done in sitting, standing, kneeling, so of a wide variety. Sessions would involve touch, um, gentle, touch, gentle movements led by the practitioner, but also verbal cueing, uh, how to sense, how to feel, and it also using verbal ideas, verbal uh, directions to help the client uh, integrate movement themselves more directly. In the group format on the right is an awareness through movement class. These classes are verbally guided and um, 
you'll see here myself standing up as I'm guiding students. They do not need to see the practitioner uh, teaching. We don't model it because we want people to discover from the inside out. I suppose if I was going to call somatic learning a particularly shortcut way, another thing I would say is it's learning from the inside out as opposed to trying to move like someone else because we know that each of us are very unique. And what's most important, what's most important is that we each discover what's the unique way in which I can move in this moment that feels right for me, that works for me. So we're going to take a look here at a, a lovely video put out of, uh, some time ago about Baby Live, exploring the uh, process of movement and, and really the process of making herself. I mean, she was born knowing that she, uh, knowing at some level that she was going to remake herself. Without movement, she's not going to map her brain. And she does this just so lovely. There is words to go with this video that are words that you would hear frequently in an awareness through movement class. And there's a beautiful quality to the way that she moves that I want to give you just a sense of, because this is how a really good Feldenkrais Awareness Through Movement session or class would, uh, would work. And I just accidentally hit the wrong button. Here we go. And you may or may not hear the music. It's just little background music. The words and the, the visual are the most important. All her attending to herself and her experience. She loves looking at her hands. This is a very potent connection into the brain that we use even with adults. She's feeling. Her brain is getting a sense of her feet, her hands for the first time. finding out how she can use the ground. The wonderful thing about babies is, of course, they don't do things that hurt themselves. movements are kind of random in the beginning. She doesn't really know what she's doing. She's just playing. She's feeling. Learning how to use gravity. And they rest a lot. And you would be instructed to rest in your classes, in your sessions, a lot. She's about to do a roll there. And she doesn't know she's going to roll. She's just organizing her eyes and her hand, and she's just looking for something she wants. delighted with herself. And that's what we would have hoped to have happen for you in Feldenkrais classes and in your private sessions, whether it is about your breathing or your chewing or your swallowing or navigating, that you would become delighted with yourself. And it turns out that this way of her engaging with herself 
is actually the same thing that we're using with adults, except we have to really coach adults much more along these lines because we're so used to tuning out uh, from ourselves in this kind of way. So I'm actually going to lead you here in a moment on a, a short little version of a Feldenkrais Awareness Through Movement session. And to do that, I want to give you some cues for how you can stay safe. So we go so slow. I mean, slow, slow, and slower is a great way to go. Move and stay in a very small, comfortable range. We are not about end ranges of movement, but we almost like to play in the beginning initiation of a movement more than we like to see how far we can go. If you find that something I suggest is not within your easy, comfortable range, you can use your imagination. The brain really doesn't know the difference between an imagined movement and a real movement. Uh, this is something that athletes know, and they use their imagination all the time, so you can take advantage of that powerful aspect of yourself. And an injured or painful area can often be helped by moving a distal area, something that's really interesting. So instead of uh, moving a painful area, we sometimes move a distal area. We're going to be working with the pelvis a little bit here in this first movement exploration. So for an example, if you have pain in your shoulder or your neck, you might think, what's this going to have to do with my shoulder or neck? But it does, because everything is connected. And by moving somewhere else that's a little further removed, we can often affect that injured or painful area much more potently, I would say almost always more potently, than if we were to work with it directly. And tune into your breathing so that you can notice perhaps that you hold or you change your breath so that you get a signal, oh, hey, that's for doing something a little bit less. I put up a little peaceful picture here for you, but actually, because this is a Feldenkrais uh, lesson, you're not I'm, you're not going to see me doing the movement. You're going to listen to my guidelines for doing the movement. It would actually be better if you were to look away from your screen for a moment, and I'll tell you when to look back so you don't looking into that bright light. If you're in bed and you're holding up an iPad, you would set that down beside you in a way that you could still hear. If you're sitting in a chair at a computer, that's great too. And you could come forward on the chair as long as you're comfortable sitting unsupported. And your feet are flat on the ground, about pelvis width apart. If you're lying in bed, I would, I would bend my, your knees and put the feet on the uh, bed and your knees up towards the ceiling. And we just start with just noticing your rear end on the surface. If you're sitting, it'll be your two sitting bones, perhaps, or your two buttocks that you notice. If you're lying, it's the back side of your pelvis. And just feel your breath for a moment. Your breath arising and your breath falling. Just nothing to change, only noticing. Now begin to do a little movement of tilting your pelvis in such a way that the low back would arch a bit. And then you come back to your resting position where you were. Remembering, we go slow, we go small. Again, just barely tilt your pelvis a little bit in a way that your low back arches a little. If you're lying down, it would come away from the bed. If you're sitting, it gets a little further away from the back of the chair. And then you release. Take a pause, and when you're ready, do that simple movement again. Yeah, that's it. Now come back to the resting position, and now you're going to do a movement with the pelvis that allows the low back to round back a little bit towards the chair or the bed. And then you come back to your starting position again, only going to the rounded, slightly rounded, it's a very small amount, you feel your tailbone, it's kind of tucking under a little, and you come back again to the neutral position. Good. 
Jamie, just one more of that, either, on your, either in your imagination or actually do the movement, and then pause. Now we're going to connect this two movements. You tilt so that the belly is coming a little towards the knees, the low back is arching. And just notice the cues that I'm giving you that help you know what kind of movement are you doing. Are you doing the same one that I'm talking about or not? And then you tilt in such a way that the tailbone rounds a little under, like it's going to point a little more towards the nose, and the low back is rounding back. As you come forward on the sitting bone, the back is arching a little bit, the tailbone sticks out behind you a little. You're starting to rest a little more towards your pubic bone. Your pubic bone is starting to tilt a little bit towards the floor. And when you come back on your sitting bones, the tailbone rounding under a little bit, the pubic bone is sort of facing a little bit more up the wall or towards the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Good. Now begin to notice if you're doing the movement in any way that coordinates with your breath. Being quiet because you need quiet now to really notice that. Are you tilting forward, back arching, tailbone sticking out a little on the in breath or the out breath? Or are you rounding the low back a little bit, sitting back a little more towards your tailbone, tailbone coming under? on the in-breath or the out-breath? Or were you holding your breath? Okay. So pause with that for a moment. Just come back to a neutral position. And just feel your breath. Don't change it. No need to change it. It's a very non-judgmental work. We don't have to make things right. Allow your breath to come up, flow in, allow your breath to flow out. Feel if when you breathe in, if the belly swells a little, just naturally. When you breathe out, if the belly becomes a little softer or flatter. Not because you have to work at it, it just does. So let's connect the pelvic movement now in one way with breath in this little short time. As you breathe in, go ahead and let that belly get nice and full with its breath in, letting the belly come towards the knees, the low back arches just a little bit. And then as you breathe out, shift your weight towards the tailbone, rocking back on your sitting bone, being a little shorter, the low back rounding a little bit. Take a moment just to coordinate that with your breath very gently. Even sitting or lying on the bed, pretty doable. Definitely doable in your imagination. Doing two or three or four movements. So just let that go and just feel yourself now in sitting or in lying. Maybe you feel something about the, the length of your spine, the quality of your resting, quality of your thinking. An awareness through movement lesson is actually usually going to be 45 to 60 minutes. So we had about five, six, seven minutes there at the most. So you can tell that's not going to be a full lesson, but it is going to give you some real clues to the quality of exploration that we do within the work. And you can look back at the screen now. A book that I highly recommend for anyone struggling with a chronic issue is The, um, the Brain's Way of Healing by Dr. Norman Doidge. 
and Dr. Deutsch is really trying to bring the possibilities of neuroplasticity uh, to be more front and center in our explorations of health. He does happen to feature two chapters about the Feldenkrais method as one of the ways to work with neuroplasticity in his book, but there's other modalities presented well there too. And he just does a beautiful job of helping you, anyone I think, understand how the incredible capacity of the brain to keep changing its form and function throughout our lives can be a benefit to us in all situations, but particularly in highly challenging ones. He provides within his book core principles of the Feldenkrais Method, and so you have a really nice resource to go to and also one that I think is maybe a little more objective in our own materials. I thought I would use his principles. So the mind programs the functioning of the brain. The mind is really putting together everything that the brain and the body is doing and feeding it back and somehow making sense out of our lives. A brain cannot think without motor function. This is one of the things that we talked about earlier. So we cannot think without movement. Awareness of movement is key to improving movement. This is kind of a big statement, but your sensory system is intimately tied to your movement system. So using self-awareness and monitoring of the experience makes improvement in the movement system itself. Feldenkrais had a thing he liked to say that you can't do what you want if you don't know what you're doing. And um, this is an aspect of using your awareness to improve movement. Differentiation builds brain maps, and we do differentiation uh, by trying to make the smallest possible sensory distinctions. We're going to talk in a little bit about uh, brain maps, and one way to think about it is that um, the parts of ourselves that we use the most have the largest territory in the brain map, and the parts of ourselves that we use the least, the brain actually starts to sort of ignore them, doesn't, doesn't really even almost know that they exist. So we want to round out those brain maps. One way that we do that is by these very small differentiations. In this little tiny snippet of Feldenkrais awareness through movement, we started to make a tiny set of differentiations in the pelvis, in the low lumbar vertebra, in your sensation of yourself as your belly is tilting, as your low back is changing shape, as your tail is moving through the air. All of these tiny distinctions turn around and cause your brain map to get clearer about the various parts of yourself. Differentiation is easiest to make when the stimulus is smallest. So the smaller the movement or the less effort put into it, the easier it is to sense. Uh, you could think about this as a burning candle is very hard to see in daylight. You could have a candle burning in a room during day, and might, somebody might not even notice this over there, but they would definitely notice it in the dark. If you're holding a feather and a fly lands on the feather, you'll probably notice that weight. If you're holding a dumbbell and a fly lands on the dumbbell, you're not going to notice it at all. So using smallness uh, can really come to our advantage. I'm going to wait till that siren goes by. Sorry about that. Slowness of movement is key to awareness, and awareness is the key to learning. That's a big one, too. Now, I remember this old story. I love to tell this. I read this poem. I don't know if it was by Ellen Bath or someone that she just published in one of her books years ago on healing. But she tells this story about, you know, I'm uh, running down the street, and I fall in a hole. Didn't know the hole was there. fell in the hole. Crawl out of the hole. The next day I walk down the street, I know the hole is there, I still fall in it. I crawl out of the hole. The next day I walk down the street, I know the hole is there, I try to walk around the hole, I still fell in the hole. The next day I walk down the street, I try to walk on the sidewalk across from the hole, I still fall in the hole. The next day I walk down a different street. Ah. So each day there's this building of um, better awareness, and it's 
and there's a slowing down quality that we use in the awareness through movement and in the functional integration lessons that allows you to become more and more aware, closer and closer to the, the point of initiation, because it actually begins right when you start to think about reaching for your glass. That's your motor pattern, your habitual action starts right when you start to think about reaching for the glass. So the closer we can help you come to being aware of that moment, the better chance you have of reaching for a glass this time without causing yourself some kind of pain in your, say, right shoulder. Reduce the effort whenever possible. This is a biggie. We need to calm the nervous system. Calming the nervous system makes the, reduces the level of noise in the background. It allows the, the pathway to being able to really observe and listen to details. Very difficult to observe and listen to details when there's a lot of additional um, jitteriness, pain, um, or muscular effort. We want to open that doorway to doing something a truly different way instead of the habitual one that's kind of outworn its welcome. Errors are essential. This is, this is really different. Errors are essential. No right way to move, only better ways. You probably have experienced a lot of guidance about, hey, there's a right way to do this exercise, do it this way, let me show you how to do it, this is the way you need to do it. Well, we are very different than that. We, we want to encourage you not to try to move so much correctly, but to move very many different ways, just like Baby Liv did. And for you to be able to notice which feels better, which, which leads to a better outcome for you. This mapping of variety is, is a, a lively brain. It's a brain that has resiliency and an ability to choose between more than one way to move at any given time. Random movements provide variation that leads to developmental breakthroughs. And we actually got to see this in Baby Live. So babies are not thinking about rolling over. They're just experimenting with uh, sensations and movement. And they don't even really know why their arm is swinging through space. But then suddenly their, hand, their eyes are maybe following their hand, and maybe they hear a noise over there, and maybe a couple of hours or two days or three days before they had learned something about pressing with one foot on the ground, and suddenly it all comes together in a series of accidental moves, and they've rolled over. Now their brain really takes note of that, for sure, and starts trying to figure out how to recreate it. But in the beginning, it's just accidental. So you could have random movements that uh, to you might seem like we're guiding you in something that's nonsensical, but your brain will make sense of it. Even the smallest movement in one part of the body involves the entire body. Whoa. So a breath in, a breath out involves the entire body. Swallowing involves the entire body. Muscles have to be able to activate, and other muscles have to be able to be inhibited. And it's going all up and down the chain. So we want to include, again, come back to wanting to include uh, these small basic movements as part of the foundation of improvement, not just to uh, skip to the big movements of walking or reaching. Many movement problems and the pain that goes with them are caused by learned habit, not by abnormal structure. This is also a, a hard one uh, and probably going to be fairly difficult um, for you to take in at this point. And it, so it's not to say that there aren't abnormal things happening. There really are many abnormal things that happen in human beings. But it's also very easy to get caught in thinking that the abnormality is what always causes the problem. And this just, we know this isn't true. Um, right now, there's a lot of great research out on MRIs showing how the or abnormalities on MRIs do not correlate with pain. They don't even correlate with uh, in decreased function in many cases. So it's really important that we don't assume that things cannot change. It's almost better to assume that by improving the quality 
of our movement, the, some of the pain or a lot of the pain might actually go away. And um, the, the key is how to do that without causing more pain or injury. If we were going to have only one principle in the Feldenkrais method, I would have to say it is this one. Less pain, more gain. Less pain, more gain. So very different than, uh, again, some uh, exercise approaches or therapeutic approaches. Although I do think it's catching on more and more um, that it's important to stay within an easy, comfortable range. Also within the Feldenkrais method, that's something that's maybe quite different for you is that we emphasize bones and joints over the muscles. Feldenkrais felt that bones and joints were much easier for a person to map. They're kind of more linear, more solid. Um, muscles go every which way, and they also have quite a lot more of them in the body. So that the message is that we can feel and send through sensing and mapping our bone structure is quite potent. And I think this is one of the reasons that you're going to find um, a somatic approach like the Feldenkrais method, or we'll talk also about bones for life and walk for life, to be particularly effective for you. Uh, it takes it away from the problem areas that you're used to focusing on and allows you to find something sturdy that you can count on. Anytime we can defocus from a problem area and recruit unused aspects of ourselves, we've clarified our brain map and we're increasing our resources. Here are some variations on a functional integration sessions with two different people I've worked with in the past. So this gives you an idea that functional integration, the private sessions, can look a lot of different ways. And again, in a private session, it's really the practitioner's job um, and yours to explore together what's going to be right for you given your situation and uh, and not only on the physical level, but, you know, what's your personality, what's your goals, your hopes, what is it you want to be able to do with your uh, life or just to be able to do even today that's different. So all of those things are taken into consideration so that a practitioner can come up with a lesson on that day. We call our private sessions even lessons um, in order to uh, help you explore what you're most interested in. So some sessions might be extremely quiet, uh, and others might look a lot like play. In Awareness Through Movement, that group format, we, again, are leading people through verbal um, lessons. Here are three popular photos you're going to see out all over websites when you leave here tonight and you start looking around for it, and I just wanted to show you some of these. It's true that we have lessons that work with just the breath or just your eyes or painting the inside of your skull or rolling a, a ball along your body and your imagination or mapping your spine and your limbs by having a sense of a fire hydrant moving through you. But those don't make very interesting pictures. So I don't want these pictures to scare you if you go, oh, no, those are not going to be safe from me. Um, we have to have pictures out there that uh, give people some sense of what can happen. But there are more robust lessons, too. I mean, we have a thousand or more lessons, and some of them might be involved, you know, rolling or hopping or some things that are uh, much more active. So if you're checking out uh, classes, I think it's important to ask the teacher what, you know, sort of night level or what's the range of the movement lessons and discuss with them what your concerns are ahead of time. Um, a lot of things can be adjusted within the class, but some lessons might just be too robust to really be able to do in your imagination or to be adjusted to your particular situation. So it's good to check out with the instructor and, you know, what type of lessons they're teaching right now and what it's aimed at. So I'd like to now take a look with you um, at that lesson we actually started to develop together just a second ago, which was to improve a developmental pattern of coordinating the tail, head, and eyes. 
and I recorded just a little bit of me doing this lesson because I think it's important to see how slowly it, it is done and how um, detailed we would go along. So I'll, I'll come along with you to uh, verbally guide you through some of this. It's going to go very quick. It's going to go very quick, but um, again, it's not going to be a 45-minute lesson. It's taking a 45 or 60-minute lesson and, and putting it down to just a few little bits. So here, uh, I'm sitting and just sensing, and you would be guided again in this sensing of yourself. And then there's an instruction being given to do a very small movement of rounding the low back. And you can see the movement happening here between the two white bars. But already, um, it's starting to expand just a little bit. Now, that would have taken maybe 15 minutes to get to. And even though there's this expansion now going up all the way to the base of the skull, there's a still a very small, gentle quality about it. And there would be some aspects in here just as you experience to pay attention to your breath, and the sensation of weight shifting even on the feet, and um, you know, what's happening in the chest and the breastbone. Jumpy here, I'm not sure why. And then we would introduce another element, such as the eyes. You might be able to come back later and just actually pause this and play with some of these elements. I would pause it each time a new element was introduced. So here the eyes are traveling along the floor and then up the wall and then starting to come up to the, um, a little bit higher than the wall even. And now there's a differentiation. So the eyes are looking up. The head and eyes are looking up as the pelvis is rounding under. So, and then it goes into just the eyes moving opposite to the head. Eyes looking down while the other pattern is happening. So remember we talked about differentiation earlier and making the smallest possible differentiation. These differentiations are very challenging, very challenging. Now, also in a Feldenkrais Awareness Through Movement lessons, we do quite a lot of them on the floor, um, or that means that there's a lot that you can actually do in a bed. Here we have a leg coming up and coming to plant on a surface. And this is a, something that's really important with EDS, I believe, is just to learn to feel pressure contact with the surface. The instructor would give a lot of cueing for just moving the foot around and finding different points that you could feel power in. If you replay this tomorrow, I believe you'll get a little cleaner video with it. Um, I'm not certain about that, but I believe you will. And then also we would play with going from just function to function into pleasure. And I wanted you to get a sense of this, that, hey, there can be really pleasurable movements that develop. Rolling to sit is an important function for getting out of bed or getting up from the floor. And in this video, I demonstrate five or six different ways of rolling to sit connected together fairly uh, quickly. And then eventually, we're actually going to go into a pattern uh, that's more challenging, so it shows you how the lessons can build to be more robust, which would be holding on to the feet. Here I'm reaching across, a really great way to get out of bed, by the way, to reach across and fold your legs up towards you a little bit. And then here we have my coming to hold my feet, something babies like to do a lot of and play around with their feet. And this is really one of the ways babies accidentally sit is they're thinking about getting that foot in their mouth. I'm not thinking about that. That's not going to happen for me, and you shouldn't be trying to make that happen. But taking this pattern, I can begin to play and feel the ground. I can feel my articulations coordinating. I can use my body against the floor and actually come up rolling up to sit. Using the ground surface is going to be really valuable for you with EDS. 
being able to feel the parts of yourself against the surface like that is going to be very helpful. Now, I chose to be unpadded here um, because of the type of thing I was doing. I didn't want the pad to distract you, but you should be on a padded surface. You should be comfortable. And then we would also help people roll up to um, actually come from sitting all the way up to standing. And again, a lesson like this rolling to sit holding the hands, that might take course uh, place over um, a number of lessons before that was even on the table to explore. So that gives you some ideas again about how slowly we're doing a lesson, what the quality of which we're doing a lesson is like. So I'd like to give you another opportunity for another movement lesson. And again, I think this can be done whether you're sitting or lying in bed. Also, if you can look away from the screen, that'll be helpful. And I'll tell you when you can look back at the screen again. This one's going to be just a little bit longer than the last one. And it's going to deal with something that an awful lot of people struggle with, which is easy, comfortable rotation of the head and the neck. So as you're sitting or as you're lying, and maybe you could close your eyes so you're not looking at bright light, and just again, just come to feeling the length of your spine, however that is right now. Feel your head attached to your spine. Feel your neck as it attaches into the upper back. Your two shoulder blades. And begin to just turn to the right, to look to the right in a, whatever is your easy, comfortable range. Please don't strain. Do not cause yourself any pain. If you're lying in bed, that'll be more like a roll. It won't actually be a turn. It'll be more like a roll, rolling up the head. And just notice where you're looking, what you see. Uh, open your eyes for a moment. Notice what you look, what you see and then close your eyes and come back to your starting position. And do that one more time and feel what's the quality of the movement feel like in your neck muscles. What do you sense there? Is it comfortable, easy? Does it kind of have a little jumps and starts or does it feel really smooth? And again, come back to the middle. And now roll or turn your head to the left. Eyes are still closed. When you get over there, just open them, notice what you see, and then bring your head back to the middle again. One more time to the left, feeling the quality of the turning. Compare your sensation between the two sides. So I know that for some of you, sensation is not easy, but you can utilize sensation differences between one side and the other. There's some kind of difference there. What is that for you? It's enough to ask the question. You don't even have to have an answer. But at least you're asking the question, which makes your brain start to light up. Now, again, if you have your, you're in sitting, I'd have your feet flat on the ground and your hands on your thighs. If you're lying down, I'd have your knees bent and your feet flat on the bed. And you're looking forward, and if you're comfortable having your eyes closed, I would continue with that. And you're going to just start to turn your shoulders a little to the right, and then come back to the middle with them. So that means your left shoulder's coming a little forward, your right shoulder's going a little bit back, and they're connected by your breastbone. So your breastbone is turning a little bit to the right. It had a flashlight. It would be shining a flashlight a little to the right and then back to the middle. Start to allow your head and your eyes just to be going along for the ride. They're no longer trying to turn, but they're attached to the top of the spine. So as the shoulders and the breastbone turn your upper back, the neck and the head are being turned a little bit too. And again, the movement can be very, very slow, very, very small. When you come back this next time to the middle, pause for a moment. And 
if your hands are on your thighs. Begin to turn again, but let your hands slide. This means your left hand might slide forward and your right hand might slide back. Or if you're on the bed, you might just feel the changing pressure of the arms on the bed. Can you do that movement and attend to your breathing? That the breathing is easy and uninterrupted. Just very simple. And now each time that you do the movement, make it half the size of the last movement. Hmm. It might have been going pretty small anyway. Now we're going to make each movement half the size. Much smaller. Good. And then pause. And if you're comfortable to remain with your eyes closed for a moment more, do that. Do your breath coming up and your breath falling. Now with your eyes open or closed, have them looking forward in space. It's really, if you've got a lot of bright lights from the computer, it'd be great if you can keep them closed, but that may not feel possible. So you're going to leave your eyes looking forward in space. But now you're going to let everything else turn just like it was before. So your eyes stay looking forward. They don't get to go to the right with you. This is a big differentiation movement. The shoulders are turning. Hands are sliding. Your nose is turning a little bit. Breast bone is turning a little bit to the right and back. But the eyes stay forward the entire time. Always good to have a little sense of humor about these kinds of movements. There would be no value to them at all if they were really simple to do. It's really the process of waking up the brain to go, hey, I got some parts here, parts I hadn't been thinking about in a while. And then come back, front, close your eyes again, hands on your thighs and just turn again, letting the hands slide, letting the shoulders turn, letting your upper back turn, noticing now how your weight is shifting in the pelvis. You're actually weighting more heavily on one side of your rump as you turn and then it changes as you come back. And if that's not true, you can just ask yourself, could you allow the freedom in your spine, in your body, for that to be possibly true? Good. Then come back to the middle. Open your eyes as you like. And with your eyes open, just turn to look to the left and notice where you're looking now and what the ease and the quality of turning is like. Back to the middle. Turn to look to the right. Notice what your ease and quality of looking is, is like. Turning to the right. Come back to the middle. And I imagine that you've got some improvement. And again, this is just a tiny little snippet of an awareness through movement lesson in which there would be rest intertwined and you would be continually coached to take breaks, uh, change the movement according to how you need it, and to do, um, be creative in making adaptations for yourself. So you're not trying to please the teacher and get everything right the whole time. It really is a very permissive process. So you can look back at the screen now. I'm really looking forward to hearing how some of the movement explorations go for you in the, in the Q&A. Something I thought might be helpful to talk just a minute about is to stretch or not to stretch. And 
We are not real big fans of isolated muscle stretching. Um, we Animals do not seek out how to stretch their hamstrings. I suppose you could say they're not smart enough to do so, but you'll certainly see them rolling around and doing funny and spontaneous full body stretches, and they play, and they get a lot of stretching in the process of living out their life. There is, within awareness through movement, uh, um, opportunities for a light stretching sensation, but it occurs as part of a movement pattern uh, where stretching of a specific muscle is not the goal. And we like these coordinated ways of teaching the musculature how to activate and how to inhibit. When muscles know how to inhibit or rest or activate, when they know how to do that instead of being chronically contracted, they really return more to their natural length. Also, research has shown that stretching does not help with preventing muscle soreness and exercise. It really doesn't work for the warm-up for preventing of injury before exercise. Flexibility does not necessarily equal success in movement. Not everyone is meant to touch their toes, and if you want to do something like sprinting, you're going to need to have um, hamstrings that have got some propulsive force in them, so they're going to be short. And I'll, uh, last, I'd just point out that there has been a study of Feldenkrais awareness through movement, which looked at uh, it versus stretching for hamstring flexibility, and I put references down below here for these things that you can look up on your own if you like. And they found that there was a six, almost a 6% gain in those who did Feldenkrais awareness through movement versus the control group that was doing stretching. So um, for us, it's not so much about lengthening a specific muscle, but about how can we increase the um, functional use of ourselves. The aim of a person, the aim of a person that is organized is to move. The aim is a person that is organized to move with minimum effort and maximum efficiency, not through muscular strength, strength, but through increased consciousness of how movement works. And that's really what we're about, increasing your own consciousness of how movement works for you. I also like to talk a little bit about movement intelligence work by Ruthie Alon. Ruthie is now in her mid-80s, still a very active teacher of her work. She developed uh, an umbrella of work based on her 50 years of experience in the Feldenkrais method. She studied with Dr. Feldenkrais, one of his original students, and um, you know, has highly respected within the Feldenkrais world. She's always been known as one of our more flexible um, instructors, more flexible movers, and you might even find some beautiful videos out on YouTube called Movement Nature Meant that are done by her, I think, when she was in her 60s. As she was uh, in her 60s, actually, going into her 70s, she noticed that she her posture was not what she wanted it to be, even though she was a flexible mover. She didn't feel like she was aging with the kind of strength that she wanted. She had osteo, was diagnosed with osteoporosis, and that was a surprise to her. And... Um, she started to ask herself, well, what could I do to reinterpret uh, Dr. Feldenkrais's work and along the lines of um, power, uprightness, and uh, alignment? So it's not that the Feldenkrais work doesn't address these issues, but she was just looking for a more direct pathway to getting there than perhaps the Feldenkrais work does. I would say, in my opinion, the Feldenkrais work does emphasize flexibility a little bit more than does Bones for Life, which for you could be really uh, very valuable. And that's why I wanted to present this work as well for you. Um, so Bones for Life, <clears throat> I'm going to show you just some differences. I hope this video will come through well. Some differences in Bones for Life that you will uh, notice. What we're going to be showing is uh, the use of not being just on the floor, but putting the feet or the hands on the wall. This kind of constrained surface makes um, a really big difference. Hmm. Okay, let me try that. 
that again. Yeah, there we go. When you can limit the various ways that the body can interpret pressure, it helps a lot. So if you have hyperflexible joints, having a surface behind, a surface off of which to move, makes it much more difficult for you to uh, get movement lost in a specific joint. Here we're using force through the foot on the wall to cultivate a wave-like response. As I press, the counter force brings the low back closer and brings the neck away. I'm not purposefully doing that. That is just happening. And this is one of the things that you want the spine to be able to do, and it offers proportional flexibility of each each individual vertebra. You see also this very jiggly motion I'm doing right now, and a jiggly motion can get much deeper into the spinal musculature. We also do a movement called um, letting axis travel through the spine. So here it's more like all the vertebrae stay stacked on each other, and there is a long stick-like motion instead of a wave motion which goes up and down. The whole body moves up and down a little bit really lovely for people struggling with alignment and joint issues to be able to get this kind of alignment, this kind of sensation. We don't do it just from the feet. We also do it from the hand on the wall, which allows us to get better neck health, better shoulder health, better upper shoulder girdle health. Here again, a wave motion, pressing through the hand and getting that wave, and then the foot was jiggling, but now we're moving to axis. And now we have that long, thick motion again. Really very nice. And for people who struggle with hyperflexible issues. We're going to go next to uh, the use of a wrap. And this I think you're going to really like. So anytime you can get some nice compression around the joints, you're, you're uh, going to get more proprioceptive information. Here this wrap is uh, wrapped around the hip joints to give the hips a lot of security. And then it comes up over the shoulders to help you uh, reinforce the length of your spine. And then we can coordinate that into walking patterns in place or around the room. This can also be used in sitting, by the way. So if you were uh, not really able to walk around the room yet, but you wanted to get your locomotion patterns and sitting, you could play with this. This is one of many different types of wraps that we use. Here's another one where it's tied in a braid at the front. And this allows you to discover the front of your spine. It's really lovely and helps you learn to stack everything up. And then we can coordinate it with downward pressure through the feet coming up and coaxing in the low back into a um, aligned position for bearing weight. So that gives you some ideas of um, Bones for Life. Bones for Life is not nearly as vast. There's only 90 movements in Bones for Life, and uh, most of my public classes are going to stay in the first 30 or 45 movements, and I think almost all of those depending on what's going on with you, would be pretty doggone safe. And additionally, they use the same, same principles that we use in the Feldenkrais work about working within your own comfortable range, staying safe, going slow, using your imagination. Walk for Life, if you're wanting to get out and be able to walk a little bit more, is a program that um, she developed that teaches you how to use trekking poles. And I do really like trekking poles for helping with hip and low back stability and also upper back health. So this could be another option for you. A little bit harder to find Bones for Life and Walk for Life teachers uh, in your area. There's not as many of them around. But I still think it's an important option for you to know about. Well, how in the world do these approaches work? That's a great question, isn't it? And these approaches are really um, designed to capitalize on neuroplasticity. And that is this potential that virtually every person is capable of learning. Every person is capable of learning. 
The brain can and will change in form and function for the better if it can get good information to use. We do this through calming the nervous system. We improve the internal communications through that calming by asking potent sensory questions, by feeding in new information that really grabs the brain's attention through these differentiations. All of this enhances your self-image, and we'll look a little bit at brain maps in a moment. We are deprogramming habitual habits. I mean, you know, many of you listening are probably now 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, so you're pretty habitual in the way that you move. And it takes a little bit of skill to deprogram that and give you a palette of options. There's also a really nice element of critical thinking, learning to sense, think, ask questions, do the experiment, get the results, do another experiment that can really carry over outside the lessons into uh, your movement patterns in life. The brain map, or as I would call one brain map, um, the homunculus, this was um, a way of mapping the body as it's represented within the brain discovered by Wilder Penfeld, and he used electrical stimulation of the brain to figure out what parts and how much of the brain was devoted to different areas of the body. And he found that, oh, if a person uses their hand more, they end up with a very large area of the brain devoted to the hand, and typically the mouth, the tongue for feeding, the nose, the eyes, pretty large in representation. It's different for each person, but this is somewhat typical of a Western society. And it's a great example of use it or lose it. That is, if you do not move an area of your body, if you have no awareness of it, your brain really starts to almost not know it's there. It doesn't even give it any territory for activating it. The good news is you've got a plastic brain, you start to use it, and we can start to bring that back into your body map. So I think this is something that Feldenkrais work is particularly good at, somatic approaches is particularly good at, is helping you get things back into your image of yourself, into your brain, um, so that it is available for your use. And I'm glad you're going to be getting a discussion on pain next month because you really can't um, talk about changing movement patterns without talking about changing the pain maps of the brain. I've got several resources here that I would recommend that you read uh, down here at the bottom that are all excellent. You know, you just can't get enough of what you don't want sometimes, and pain is along those lines, chronic pain. I'm going to make a differentiation here between acute and chronic pain. There's wonderful research being done on this now. Something that we've been taught in the Feldenkrais work that research is showing is, hey, pain's demanding. And when it lasts over time, the brain starts to produce more and more of it, and it can't even trust it after a while. The brain is so literally changed by it that that homunculus picture that you saw, well, the pain starts to take over larger and larger areas of representation in the brain. And those areas need to be available for actually learning new movement, for example. We don't want it to be... It's consuming more and more. Pain is valuable when it helps us know about a current acute injury or a pattern we shouldn't do, but it's not valuable whenever it's something that's actually not going to cause us injury and it just keeps producing it over time. And um, it just turns out the brain is, again, plastic, so it can tend to get caught up in, um, I mean, rightfully so, it notices pain in the beginning. And then it can get confused and start to produce pain messages over time that are not helpful. So we don't want to get rid of that, but we do want to start to reduce it back to what its normal function would do. And Feldenkrais, we do that through, um, again, going very, very slowly, lowering the general tone, helping people learn to move without pain, but perhaps even more importantly, we do it by introducing new novel movements that the brain really likes to pay attention to. And that starts to reroute some of the resources. And this is how I believe it's happening. It starts to reroute some of the resources away 
from um, the pain signal and to this new discovery. So we, we love new discoveries. This is great. So let's give it something new to discover. Another way that these approaches work is through proprioception. And I know that's a big uh, word for you all and uh, on your mind. Proprioception is, the, uh, is, a, is a key aspect of movement, and this is your ability to know where you're at in space, as well as where your body parts are at in relationship to each other. Now, really, improvement in proprioception comes out of this neuroplastic system that you have, but I wanted to pull it out since it is such a big topic for you. Slow, gentle, novel experiences um, help improve your self-image as well as your proprioception. And proprioception, I believe, is really enhanced by an interplay between weight-bearing or compressive forces, range of motion, tactile sense, verbal cueing. So it's not just about range of motion. It's not about getting to the maximum range of motion. Uh, it's this interplay between weight-bearing and compressive forces and range of motion. So very, very important to be able to go back and forth between those. You do not have to be able to go to end range in motion to improve your pro proprioception. And in range to me means that for you, it would often mean going too far because we don't know when is too far for people who have a hyperflexible system. Often we are too far before we know it. So we use these really fine distinctions and somatic approaches for growing our capacity to sense. And as we become more skilled at feeling, we, we know, we feel, we sense not only our arm moving through space, but the bones of the arm moving through space and then how those bones are connected and how those bones are even turning in relationship to each other. We can find ways to support that arm from the feet, from the pelvis, from the ribs. So very, um, very valuable, I think. It appears from some of your research, I did a small, small uh, literature review that uh, people with EDS have less proprioceptive capacities, but I also found a study that shows that even if you start with less proprioceptive capacity, you actually improve at the same rate as a healthy person. So hey, you know, this is something that somatic approaches are tend to be good at, and what would it mean for you to increase that intelligence by 5, 10, 20 percent? You know, I think it would mean a lot. So if we can tap into your plastic brain through movement, awareness, and comfort and curiosity, not only to reduce pain, but to help you know where you're at in space, how cool could that be? And it's going to lead to you having more confidence and self-authorization, becoming your own expert. As you gain confidence, you gain more confidence. And you start to know yourself better, and it's a wonderful cycle to um, be in. How would you get started? Well, you would work with a practitioner. Uh, if you can't find a practitioner in your area, I would even do, say, a Skype sessions with you. Possibly those could work for you, depending on your situation. You can find practitioners on feldenkrais.com in the Feldenkrais work or Bones for Life, Walk for Life teachers on movementintelligence.org. Uh, I think working privately is really a good idea in the beginning, uh, especially if you have quite a lot of challenges, quite a lot of uh, pain, difficulty, or movement challenges, which I know some of you do. You could take a class. And these are awfully cost effective. I just would, um, you know, check in with the instructor ahead of time. And remember that they are not going to customize the class to you, but they're going to help empower you uh, to customize the class to yourself. And that is just so key that you feel totally empowered to do that. You could purchase a set of movement lessons for home use, two sets that I like. I've listed here. I think that they're good ones to use. These are Feldenkrais-based uh, lessons. And you could look for short video lessons online. I have some on my site, futurelifenow.com, although earlier today my site 
went down and they're trying to get it back up. So uh, hopefully by the time we're off this call, it's up. And you could also um, just look on YouTube for different types of short lessons. And again, remember these are going to be short, simple. They're certainly not going to be substitutes for a um, little further study, but I think you'll find them valuable and helpful and why not take advantage of them. And some recommended reading I'd like to give you. And uh, these things will all be present for you on the site, it sounds like, tomorrow, which is wonderful. Uh, so I think I'd like to just end with a quote that I think will mean, mean something even more, perhaps, to you than it does to some people. What I'm after isn't flexible bodies, but flexible brains. What I'm after is to restore each person to their human dignity. So some really powerful words from O'Shea Feldenkrais, and that is what I certainly would hope for you. Oh, we're going to be able now, I think, to go to Q&A. I think I'm going to stop. Yes. Thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> Wonderful presentation. I really uh, loved all the exercises, the examples that you put put through. Um, can you see the Q&A section at the top? Just to figure out where that is. And back there. And you're no longer getting screen share, is that correct, Anna? That's correct, yes. Good. Okay, I seem to be stuck in a chat window. <clears throat> getting a non-responsive page. Uh -huh. I may need to close this down and rejoin because it looks like it's locked me. Oh, hold it, hold it. Here it is. Oh, good. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay. Okay, so I'll give me a moment here to read this question. Okay. Okay. Um, so this question is from uh, Teresa, or Tessa. Sorry, Tessa. So sorry, Tessa. Can these methods be used for patients with dystonia and Ehlers-Danlos, dystonia being the secondary condition due to severe instability? Uh, yes, Tess, I believe that they can be. I would recommend that you start with someone uh, as a private practitioner and not go to a class. And uh, just go in in the beginning for a consultation and maybe just some very, very light explorations for the two of you to get comfortable with each other. If you indicate you have um, severe instability, I think you want to um, just take your time for you and the practitioner to both feel your way into it. One thing for you to remember or for anyone to remember is we're trained in movement and being specialists in helping people learn how to move. We're not trained in individual disease processes. and I mean, I think this is actually good news, although it may not seem like it to you, because what you want is our expertise in being able to really fine-tune and tailor something specifically to you, not your diagnosis, not only your diagnosis, you're more than your diagnosis, but to you and what you know about yourself and your desires and helping you learn more about that. Uh, having said that, that means that when you go into a practitioner and you say your diagnostic terms, if they don't have another background such as um, physical therapy or occupational therapy, if they may or may not have a lot of familiarity, and you may need to do some education on the topic. But what they are really educated on is helping you find your own unique way safely, carefully. This is what they're really, really good at. Okay, let's see what the next one is. Okay, so Nadja asks, would any Feldenkrais practitioner be able to help an EDS person or would they need additional training to work with EDS folks? I think that's really going to depend, Nadja, on um, the range of 
issues. So I uh, myself have only worked with a very small number of people with EDS and mostly in people who would define themselves as being hyper uh, flexible. I have not worked with anyone with, say, uh, cardiac involvement or skin involvement, for example. Um, so I believe that if your situation is uh, highly involved, you're going to want to look for a really experienced practitioner or you're going to want to look for a practitioner who also has a, a health care background and would be more familiar with the, uh, the details of the disease. However, again, uh, you're really looking for us for some outside-the-box thinking and to help you um, learn about yourself more. So I would certainly at least explore it with whoever was available in your area. Okay, I'm going to the next question. This question is actually from a Feldenkrais practitioner who is fairly new, and she had someone come to her class with EDS, and um, when she coached her to, or coached the class to feel how they were distributing movement throughout the body, uh, this individual responded a number of times that she didn't know. And is there any recommendations I have about that? Yeah, actually, the first thing I would recommend is don't assume that that's related to EDS. People have very different, not only sensory systems, but personalities. And uh, when they come to a new class, our classes are so different than uh, traditional classes that people don't know what it is they're supposed to feel first. And so they're often thinking they're not getting it right, and they don't value what they do sense. They just think it's not enough. So therefore, they think they aren't sensing anything. So I, I uh, have a client with post-polio syndrome, and I love uh, she went to see a physician uh, a year or two ago that specializes in post-polio issues, and she was presenting something, and he said, you know, it's really a mistake to assume everything's related to post-polio syndrome. I mean, a lot of things are just happening because you're aging or the way that you're living life hasn't really got much to do with post-polio syndrome. So it's very easy to start attaching everything to that diagnosis. Having said that, do I have some ideas about how to help them feel themselves more clearly? And uh, yes, I would use a lot more uh, coaching about the surface, um, so surface contact. In private sessions, I would do more holding around the arm, the leg, the joint, and, and helping with intention and that beautiful Feldenkrais touch that we have, which feels into the bone. And that's not, for those of you who are listening, that's a beautiful sensation. It's not at all harsh. Outlining the bones, outlining the parts of the arm, the leg, the shoulder, with the intention of outlining the, outlining the bone structure, putting light compression into the joint. Um, I would also just encourage in class, and some of you may have experienced this in the little lessons here, when I would ask a question, you thought, you know, you ask it, but you think, uh, I don't notice anything. I don't notice anything's an answer. And it's a perfectly good one. Um, so if you can coach more differences from one side to the other, many times people won't be able to notice it without a difference. And also, if you can just encourage people that it's enough to ask the question. That process alone is starting to wake up the brain. So none of us are expected to have this intelligence coming into class. None of us. And there would be no point in coming into class if we already had it. So just continue to um, encourage people and play with it and um, stay non-judgmental. Julie asks, how many functional integration meetings does a person generally need? Uh, once or more than once? Yes, you're going to need more than one. I've not, I've had a few miracles where somebody came for one and they got exactly everything they needed in that session um, that they wanted in that session. But we're a learning process. Alden Christ said life is a process and processes go well as long as you have more than one way to influence them. We're teaching you a process. 
Um, so I would recommend that you plan to start out with uh, at least six sessions. And if you've got a highly involved situation, maybe even having your mind up to ten, you should start to feel and notice some improvements, some differences, something that intrigues you uh, pretty early on. Um, but um, it's going to be different for each person and their sensory system. You definitely shouldn't feel like it's exacerbating or making your situation worse. And I don't think that you will. <clears throat> um, Pam asked, where are classes typically taught and what kind of license are needed to teach this? And I'm not sure I got that. Um, Pam, the classes are taught usually in private um, movement studios. I have my own studio here in Cincinnati called Future Life Now, and I teach here. I sometimes go to other locations, movement spots around town. You might find classes being taught at a few hospital-based settings around the country, but that's probably going to be more rare than not. You may also find them being offered out of yoga studios, uh, neo studios, different kinds of movement-based studios. You don't need a, life, a license, you need a certification. So we're certified by the Feldenkrais Guild. If you're in the U United States or Canada, you're certified by the Feldenkrais Guild of North America and you've completed a training program uh, for Feldenkrais that is between 800 and 1,000 hours, usually eight weeks of study over four years worth of time. Oh, it's a great question. Um, somebody said, I took a series of 10 Feldenkrais classes and found them so relaxing that I fell asleep. I didn't know how to prevent it. I stopped going. Can you suggest a way to counteract the urge to fall asleep. Wow. Yes. The first thing is you have to set your intention on staying awake if that's what you want to do. I actually think it's very helpful in um, the first uh, beginning lessons for people to fall asleep, wake back up, do a little fall asleep, especially if you're someone who's been struggling with chronic pain. But if you find that you really are sleeping through the entire class, that's a different issue. And I would first check that out with the instructor. People often tell me that they are sleeping uh, through a large portion of the class, and they like slept maybe 60 seconds at the most. It just was such a deep, restful 60 seconds that that's how it felt to them. But I can see people fall asleep and stop moving and come back. And for most people, it's really short, really short. I do have a few people that off and on will sleep quite a lot, and uh, usually I can tell these are people who really need the deep restorative aspect of sleep. So what's happening is they're coming in, the nervous system is calming down, and their brain is really going into a deep relaxation stage. Uh, Dr. Deutsch actually talks about that in his book, The Brain's Way of Healing, how important this particular stage is. However, if you're sleeping through every class, basically the entire class of 10, um, I would first set my intention on staying awake, and then I would also maybe ask the instructor if after the body scan um, was done in the beginning, if maybe they could, you could have a cue that you would agree on to help you become back alert again and go on with the movements. That's a great question. Um, are there any efforts, this is from Chris, are there any efforts to relate mindfulness meditation, as in the work of uh, John Kabat-Zinn, to Feldenkrais principles or practice? Um, though there's many of us that, that relate the principles, absolutely. There's um, so much in common to the principles in terms of how we deal with non-judgment, observation, um, and uh, the general being with. Of course, the movement aspect of it is very different, and the experimentation with movement. I don't really think I've seen too much experimentation with thought and mindfulness meditation, but there's certainly uh, very compatible pieces. 
Uh, Russell Delman, uh, one of my favorite Feldenkrais teachers, has developed his own work called Embodied Life. He's a 30-year Zen uh, meditation teacher and a 30-year Feldenkrais uh, trainer. And so he developed work called Embodied Life because he feels that it's very important for um, people to grow into full human beings to have access to both of these approaches. Also from Chris, can you say more about how pain in one body part is affected by movement in a more distal part? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. That's a nice little complex question, but I'll try to make it not a complex answer. Um, so you remember me saying that every part of the body uh, is activated in some way and every movement even say like the blinking of an eye. I know that sounds weird, but it's all happening more or less. And the better the coordinated, for example, the blinking of your eye is, the less uh, uh, overactivation you're going to get at some parts and you could get everybody doing their job related to that eye blink. Um, so it's easy to take a movement in a distal part, a part that's away from the injured area, and begin to move it, and that movement will travel, will certainly be felt and sensed in some way up in the injured area, but it's so far away that the brain doesn't have to guard against it. And you can really work in such a super fine way with the shoulder from the foot or with the neck from the foot. Today I was working through someone's foot to the new client and doing a little bit of pressure and I could see this response up in her neck that to me looks like she's had a past uh, neck injury that she hadn't told me about. So I stopped and asked and she said, oh yeah, I had this whiplash injury that was pretty significant many years ago and, um, and I'm really was glad that I hadn't been up directly yet working with her neck. It gave me a chance to, to work through her foot and see that response up there that said, oh, there's something really disorganized going on up here, and we need to uh, take our time getting there. Hope that helps, Chris. Nadja asks, can you speak a little bit what, about what happens during a lesson with when a joint hurts. I have experience with Feldenkrais, but our fellow EDSers would benefit. I'm not really sure I understand that. So it sounds like you've had a lesson in which something was happening in, in it that the joint started to hurt as a result of what was being done. Um, if that's the case, that's extremely important feedback to give to the practitioner. Um, Usually, there'll be like little moments of things coming up where people will go, I'm not sure if that feels good, and then half a second later, they're like, oh, that was fine. Uh, anything that is a downright pain, discomfort, it's very important that the practitioner be given feedback. Fairly rare, but if a person has a lot of um, chronic pain, there's gonna be, it's going to be easier to trigger these kinds of things. Um, And also from Nadja, I do Feldenkrais in combination with Pilates and myofascial release, and I find that this combination works. Do you know what other ways or combinations other EDSs are using it? I actually don't, Nadja, um, but I'm glad to hear that that's working for you. I think it's, again, going to be um, the type of Pilates and the type of myofascial release done in, in conjunction are, are going to be important. Um, that everybody is really working from this point of view of less pain, more gain. Uh, are there any practitioners in the Chicago area that you would like to recommend to? There are so many in Chicago. So this is you're in a Feldenkrais rich area, and I suspect the zip code is going to matter to you. Um, having said that, and I don't know if any of these people would be in your zip code range, but right off the top of my head, which I'm sorry for those people who aren't popping into my head immediately, uh, Mary Susan Chen, Julie Francis, 
and Lynn Sutherland are three of my go-to people. Love them, love them, love them. I think I've, I've uh, oh, she just gave me her, she just gave me, so you can put your zip code into the FeldmanKreis.com uh, directory, Sue, and people will pop up, and uh, then you can take a look at who else is there. Okay. Thank you so much. That was fun. Wonderful. I think that was the last question. Yes. Okay. Great. Oh, well, thank you, Cynthia. It's it's amazing how you can articulate and explain something that seems so abstract at first, and you did an amazing job oh, helping us understand what it's about. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and the pleasure. I look forward to um, hearing feedback, and uh, good luck with all your explorations and continued learning. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. We certainly uh, appreciate your your patience with the, the questions and the, the videos and, and the way you made that presentation. I thought really made a difference for us that we could see some of the videos and, and the detailed explanation you had. I thought really made it very meaningful. And, uh, again, uh, congratulations and thank you. And we will be posting the – recording on our site. It will also be out on YouTube, so uh, feel free to share that with with uh, your your uh, clients and other people that might be interested in, in this program. We're also going to have our next presentation uh, again on April 7th, and that is a Tuesday evening at 7.30 uh, p.m. We like to encourage people to go out to our body support store uh, dot com. Uh, that is uh, the location of, of our store. We have over 250 products of various types of pillows and, and pads and other types of braces, uh, a variety of products that are selected by EDSers for EDSers. So we encourage you to go out and, uh, and check those out. So uh, any final comments? No, I'm just really very pleased to get to explore with you. Um, this is my first webinar, so thank you so much for the opportunity. And, Deanna, I appreciate you asking me last year and being patient while I made the decision. So, um, We're happy to have you. Thank you so much. Right. I think this can be very yeah. helpful to a lot of people, you know, yeah. another another thing that they can try to, to improve their daily function and, uh, and their – Another tool in your toolbox. Yes. So, okay. Well, uh, we are going to conclude our our session for the evening, and we appreciate the, those that have joined us. And please join us again and look forward to uh, information that will be on our site uh, about Cynthia Allen's uh, the process. So uh, we're going to conclude the evening. So uh, everyone have a good evening, and, and we'll talk soon. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night.